I finished last year's Fire Red series with a playthrough using Mewtwo. As I think we all anticipated, it crushed the game, setting the only sub-hour time that I currently have. That said, it is a new year, and as a result, I'm going to go back to the start of the game and choose some Pokémon that you usually obtain early on into your adventure. So today, I'm going to be beating Fire Red with only the Beedrill line. These are the rules for my challenges, they can also be found in the description if you want to reference them later. In this video, I will be starting with a Weedle and evolving throughout the playthrough. Well, not really throughout the playthrough. I am going to do all of my evolution in the next minute or so. Also, the rival is going to pick the starter that is strong against Beedrill, and in this case, that's Charizard. The first fight against the rival in the lab is one that I did not expect to win, because Weedle's only moves are Poison Sting and String Shot. While the former gets the same type attack bonus, raising its effective power to 22, the latter is essentially useless. Also, it has 95 percent accuracy. Interestingly enough, all hope is not lost for Weedle because starting in Generation 2, Poison Sting has a 30% chance to poison its target. Additionally, this isn't Generation 1, so a poisoned target will take 1 8th damage per turn, instead of 1 16th, which is what I'm used to from Generation 1. It's also worth noting that critical hits now do a 2 times multiplier to the damage, not a level-based multiplier. As a result, when Weedle gets a crit, it does massive damage. Also, Poison afflicts the Charmander, and this allows me to win the first battle. Okay, so things are off to a great start. All I need to do is continue this momentum all the way until the champion. I'm sure that's not going to be hard at all. Normally at the start of these videos, I go through everything that makes the Pokemon, but I'm not going to go through Weedle's base stats. After all, very soon at only level 7, it evolves into a Kakuna. This dramatically changes its move pool. Instead of being Poison Sting and String Shot, it is now just Harden. That said, the defense boosting move that comes with this evolution might be extremely useful against Brock. After all, in Generation 3, he does have Rock-type moves, and as a Bug-type, Beedrill is weak to them. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm grinding on Route 1, well, it's fairly simple. In Generation 2, they changed the interaction between the Poison and Bug type. They are no longer super effective against each other, so if I go into the forest and run into a bunch of Weedle and Kakuna, the battles will be very slow, and that makes knocking out the Pidgey and Rattata quicker. Eventually, Kakuna gets to level 10 and evolves into its final form, Beedrill. This evolution brings with it Fury Attack, which is honestly not a very good move, but I can use it now to defeat the rival on Route 22 to give me more experience. Experience. After all, I think I'm going to need to level up a lot before I face Brock. And that's because of Beedrill's level up move pool. At 15, it gets focus energy, and then at level 20, it gets twin needle. Slightly counterintuitively, bug type moves are not resisted by the rock type, so this is going to deal decent damage to his rock ground Pokemon. But grinding to level 20 is going to take a long time because the medium fast growth rate levels up slowly in the early game. It really only starts to gain its momentum when it surpasses the medium slow growth rate at level 68. Beyond that, Beedrill gets gets Rage, Pursuit, Pin Missile, Agility, and Endeavor. Quite frankly, not a great set for solo running the game. Now all the TMs and HMs start to become available after I defeat Brock, so none of these moves will be useful for him. But I'll still go through them now, just so we have a sense for where we're going later into the game. Notably, Beedrill learns Toxic, Giga Drain, Solar Beam, Return, Brick Break, Sludge Bomb, Aerial Ace, Secret Power, Rest, and Thief. For base stats, it has 65 HP, 80 attack, 40 defense, 45 special attack, 80 special defense, and 75 speed. 80 attack is decent, but 45 special defense really leaves a lot to be desired. In Generation 3, damage category is determined by the type of the move, so the dark and grass type moves that Beedrill learns are not going to be particularly useful because they leverage its special attack stat. At least, that was what I thought at the beginning of this challenge. You'll have to wait and see how things play out. Ooh, foreshadowing. Now notably, if you check Beedrill's stats today, you will notice that it has 90 base attack instead of 80. This is because starting in Generation 6, some Pokémon were given increases to their base stat totals, and Beedrill was one of those Pokémon. Plus, Game Freak was kind enough to give it an awesome Mega Evolution. I really like this design, and its stats are so busted. I'm just going to go through them because I think it fixes all the problems that Beedrill has. Mega Beedrill has 65 HP, 150 attack, 
40 defense, 15 special attack, which makes sense, 80 special defense, and 145 speed. So they made it hit really hard, and it is ridiculously fast. As a bug poison type, I am going to be weak to flying, fire, psychic, and rock type moves. And the last of these is the problem in the early game. Brock's Geodude only knows Tackle and Defense Curl, but that's not the case for Onyx. It has a much better set when compared with its Generation 1 counterpart. In this case, Tackle, Bind, and Rock Tomb. At level 12, I head into the gym to face Camper Liam. He has a level 10 Geodude, which is a great litmus test to check if I'm ready for Brock. The answer is obviously no. The Geodude takes forever to knock out, so I need to do more grinding. As I exit the gym, the clock is just above 13 minutes. And now we're going to jump ahead to where I'm finishing my training, just as Beedrill reaches level 16. By the way, I went past the damage rounding threshold just because I had more PP and I wanted to use all of it up before heading back to Pewter City. Also, as I said before, I don't think Beedrill is going to do this under level 20. I think I need the same type attack bonus neutral damage of Twin Needle to be victorious. That said, the clock has just passed 19 minutes, and I did want to attempt Brock once just to see if it was possible. After all, I do have Harden, Focus Energy, and the ability to poison his Pokemon. So maybe, just maybe, a miracle can happen. Against the Geodude, since it is going to be using Defense Curl 50% of the time, I go for Harden, setting up my defense all the way until I reach plus 6. My next goal in the battle is to poison the Geodude using Poison Sting. Unlike Generation 1, Brock does not have any full heals, so once the Geodude is poisoned, it will stay poisoned until it faints. After that, I set up Focus Energy to increase my critical hit rate, and then I'm ready to use Fury Attack to do damage. I do want to mention that it doesn't feel great when the move you're using has an effective power of 7 per strike. That said, it gets to roll for multiple critical hits every turn, and with focus energy I should get a decent number of these. Surprisingly I knock the Geodude out, and my Beedrill has exactly half health remaining for the Onyx. All things considered, I'm not in a great position to win, but this fight is encouraging. It's definitely going to be possible to beat him before level 20. Same strategy against the Onyx, I use Poison Sting until the status is inflicted, and then I switch to Focus Energy. That said, Brock's Ace is just doing too much damage. While Beedrill does bring it to yellow health, it's not enough, and that's my first reset. I was feeling good though, I train up to level 18 over the next damage rounding threshold, and then I come back to face Brock again. I'm using the same strategy as before, so let's talk about Beedrill's held item, or lack thereof. Unlike Pokemon Emerald where Orin Berries are plentifully available before Roxanne, Fire Red and Leaf Green tend to be more faithful to the original games, so there are no berry trees in the overworld where you can easily pick these items up and farm them. Instead, the developers hid a limited quantity of the berries around the region as hidden items. I looked up where to find an Orin Berry, I was really hoping that I could get one before Barak, but unfortunately, and very painfully, it is available starting on Route 3. Three. The fight is so much easier at level 18. The Geodude goes down and Beedrill still has green health left over for the Onyx. Okay, hopefully I'm going to poison this thing relatively soon, and uh, that doesn't happen. I chip away at the Onyx for what felt like an eternity. I almost deplete half of its health using Poison Sting before finally Beedrill inflicts the status condition and I can start using Fury Attack. An AI interaction that's having a big role in this fight is that Onyx isn't using raw Rock Tomb anymore, this is because with minus 2, my Beedrill has less speed than Onyx. This is very important for later in the run, so please keep it in mind. When the AI is selecting Rock Tomb, it is choosing it because it thinks it is a speed control move. As a result, when the user starts moving faster than the target, the AI will start prioritizing the other moves on the Pokémon set, in this case, Tackle and Bind. The second of these is far more potent because it deals passive damage per turn. Starting in Generation 2, this is 1 16th of the trapped Pokémon's health, and because 
because this is fixed, all of my setup with Harden is not minimizing the damage I take. Still, Poison helps offset this, and eventually, Beedrill is just barely able to squeeze out a victory with only 7 hit points remaining. It clocks in with a first split of 28 minutes and 46 seconds. The game is off to a slow start, although I didn't have to level up to 20 to get access to Twin Needle. With that move on the horizon, I should probably talk about it. It hits twice, and it has a base power of 25. With the same type attack bonus, its effective power will be 37.5, and because it hits twice every time you use it, its effective power is roughly 75. Although, just note that my overlay is only going to display a single hit's effective power. Each strike has a 20% chance of poisoning the target, but this isn't where the good things end either, because Beedrill's ability is Swarm. When it's brought to one-third or less health, it will get a 50% damage boost to all bug-type moves. At the end of Route 3, I pick up a person berry, and then I head into Mount Moon, saying goodbye to the earliest portions of the game. A fork in the road lies ahead. I have to choose if I face the rival on Nugget Bridge or Misty first. Beedrill is definitely better prepared to take on Misty, after all it knows Twin Needle, and inside of Mount Moon I can pick up the TM for Thief. The Person Berry can prevent Water Pulse's confusion, and Beedrill is already faster than the Staryu, plus it has super effective damage for the Starmie. Things are much different when I consider the rival's team, because his first Pokémon is Pidgeotto, which knows Gust, a flying-type move, as well as Sand Attack, an annoying-type move. This bird is also very chunky, and I don't anticipate Fury Attack being able to take it out quickly. If I do manage it, I'll have to face Charmander, and it knows Ember. The narration I'm doing right now seems like it would be what's going through my head while I'm in Mount Moon, but I have to say when I play these challenges, I am generally hyper fixated on whatever mechanical task I have to execute at that moment. For example, I want to make sure I'm navigating the overworld and getting through menus as accurately and quickly as possible. Because of this, I often make key judgments of error in my playthroughs, I'm sure you'll all know what I'm talking about. In this case with Beedrill, it was obvious that I should face Misty next, but what wasn't obvious to me is that I should be doing a lot of training here in Mount Moon to prepare for the rival's Pidgeotto. Instead, I only fight a few trainers before proceeding to the Cerulean City Gym. Inside, I decide to face the optional Swimmer, and then the optional Goldeen Trainer. Yes, in Fire Red and Leaf Green, she is no longer mandatory. With them out of the way, Beedrill and I are ready to take on the second Gym Leader. Her lead Staryu is not much of a threat, so I set up Focus Energy on the first turn. Remember, each time Twin Needle is used, it will have a chance at critting, so I'm much more likely to get one using this multi-strike move. Before I can attack, the Staryu sets up its defense with Harden. Also, note here, there are going to be some tech problems throughout this video. Austin has been working tirelessly to help me transition this Fire Red overlay into my Emerald overlay so that they're one combined piece of software. This is going to make maintenance going forward so much easier, but it does come with the downside that there are some things to be worked out along the way. This playthrough with Beedrill was the first one I did on the new build of the software, so please excuse one or two mistakes here and there. I finish off the Staryu, and then Misty sends in her ace, Starmie. While her first Pokémon has the same speed stat between generations, the Starmie does not, so Beedrill is tied with it. The roll goes in favor of me on the first turn, allowing Twin Needle to hit, taking it to yellow health, and then it goes for Water Pulse. I have a Person Berry, but I don't even need it, and with that, I defeat the second Gym Leader. But that battle was not the difficult one in Cerulean City. So how will the rival be? Well, Pidgeotto first. I go for Twin Needle against it, hoping that it'll get a poison. Also, I didn't want to use Fury Attack, just in case it misses. But because the bug move is resisted, it doesn't do very much damage. Also, no status effect. Of course, on its first turn in battle, the Pidgeotto lowers my accuracy with Sand Attack, then Twin Needle misses, and it hits Gust, scoring a crit, doing more than half to Beedrill. Alright, this is a bad situation. I miss my next attack, Pidgeotto hits with Gust, taking me to red, and for a third time in a row I miss, and that's that. 
I don't have a lot of options here because I can't get back to Mount Moon to train, and I can't proceed to Nugget Bridge or Vermilion City because both of those paths are blocked. I need to defeat the rival now or train in the grass just west of the city. The first of these options is much more appealing because training against wild Pokemon always takes forever and it never feels very fun. I upgrade Beedrill's moveset by adding Thief in the place of Poison Sting. The Pidgeotto has slightly lower special defense, and I thought that maybe Thief with base 40 power would do more, but I'm just wrong here, I really should be using Fury Attack. I didn't figure that out in this battle, so it ends up in another loss, even though I do make it to the Charmander. Feeling defeated, I went to the wild to do some training, and while I was here I realized that I should really be using Fury Attack. The thing is, it's still not enough for Beedrill to get by the rival. I lose a total of two more times and then return to the grass to train. I want to explain to you in detail the situation that I am currently in. It's very similar to what sometimes happens in Pokemon Crystal when you can't beat the rival in Azalea Town. In that case, you can backtrack if you decided to skip trainers before Union Cave. In this case, backtracking is entirely impossible because there is no way back to Mount Moon until I get to Diglett's Tunnel. In Crystal version, sometimes even if you fight all the trainers, you will still get stuck at the rival just because his Bayleaf is so powerful. In that case, these two scenarios are identical. There are two options. The first one is to train in the wild, which takes a very long time because all of the Pokemon are underleveled. That said, I should count my blessings because the Pokemon here are actually decently leveled when compared with their Johto counterparts. The second option available to the player is to just try to luck through the fight. There are many more options to do this in Johto, so generally that is the right choice there. For example, most Pokemon can use accuracy lowering tactics through either Mudslap or Flash. Here with Beedrill, there are two primary types of luck that can go in my favor. Number one, Focus Energy will stack my crit rate and hopefully give me more of these devastating hits. Number two, Fury Attack can hit four or five times, hopefully with some crits in the mix. While training to 24, I realized that this was going to be the right choice. After all, training up in this grass to 25 or beyond is just going to take way longer than it will take to get a little bit of luck against the rival. So let's go back into that fight and see if Beedrill can do it. The answer is no right away. The Pidgeotto finishes me off because of Sand Attack. In the next fight I forego using Focus Energy just to go on the offensive right away. Fury Attack comes through for me, hitting a total of four times, doing more than half to the Pidgeotto. It uses Gust, that means my accuracy is intact, well as intact as 85% is. The luck isn't quite on my side in the next turn because I only hit two times in a row, Beedrill tanks another Gust, it now has half health, and then I finish off his lead. Okay, this is a decent position to be going up against the Charmander in. Fury Attack hits once, twice, three times, okay, four times against the Charmander, taking it to red health. Ember takes Beedrill down to low yellow health, and then I knock out his ace. Okay, so the Abra that's next is free, but the Rattata is not because it knows quick attack. I was so worried, but in this case it doesn't use it, and I finish him off. At long last, I can proceed onto Nugget Bridge. At the end of this area, there is a TM that most Pokemon want to pick up, it's Secret Power, but I play this section of the game exactly how I would in Yellow version when that TM is Seismic Toss, and as a result, Secret Power is not going to be accessible until I have Cut. I was really looking forward to not relying on Twin Needle and Fury Attack, but for now, I have to. On the other side of the tunnel, I catch my two HM users, in this case a Pidgey and an Oddish. There are easier options though. Austin told me that in a speedrun he watched, the runner chose to catch a Pidgey and a Rattata on the first route of the game. I think this makes so much more sense. Going forward in this series, that is going to be my strategy. The SSN brings with it two fantastic TMs. The first one, of course, is my favorite move, Rest. And the second one is Brick Break, which is just fantastic coverage for this bug type. With it, I am easily able to dispatch the rival on the SSN and then go up against Surge. This man is genuinely one of the worst trainers in the entire game. I would say he is worse in Fire Red than he is in Yellow, which is saying a lot. It's largely due to the fact that his Pokemon are at lower levels because he has three of them on his team instead of just one overpowered Raichu. 
My strategy here is fairly simple, focus energy followed by brick break. I don't even think I needed the focus energy because brick break one shots both the Voltorb and the Pikachu. Then Raichu does survive with a little bit less than half. It sets up double team, but it doesn't prevent Beedrill from hitting its next turn, and with that I've earned myself the third badge. And with it, I head back to Cerulean City to rectify my mistake and grab the TM for secret power. I teach it in the place of focus energy, and now I'm getting into a little bit of a problem. Beedrill's moveset is starting to become quite well-rounded. It has Brick Break, Secret Power, Twin Needle, and Thief. During the battle against the artist formerly known as the Wrapping Lass, Beedrill has a chance to learn the move Pursuit. This is not actually going to make any difference to the playthrough, even though I do put it in the place of Thief, because once I defeat her, I pick up the TM for Aerial Ace, and I teach this in the place of Pursuit. So you might think, Beedrill doesn't have any problems, its moveset is fantastic now. And yes, that is the problem. I don't want to give up any of these moves. Brick Break solves many of the rock types that I'm going to come up against. Secret Power is well-rounded, and it is also going to give me a 30% chance to inflict Paralysis in pretty much every battle. Twin Needle is my only same type attack bonus move, and that's when I should mention Sludge Bomb, because you're probably wondering when I'm going to get access to it. And unfortunately for Beedrill, Sludge Bomb is only available after you defeat the champion. I have no idea why Game Freak did this. To me, it is very frustrating, because so many many poison types would be much better in a playthrough if they could access this move. So if I want to have same type attack bonus damage, and I want it to be reliable, Twin Needle is going to be my only option. Obviously I could teach Pin Missile, but that seems more gambly, and I don't want to play that way. Finally with Aerial Ace, I can quickly knock out fighting types, and this move is fantastic if Sand Attack becomes annoying again. I'm taking my sweet time on making this point, so there's one more detail that I need to let all of you know about. Brick Break and Secret Power can both be purchased again in the department store. Aerial Ace, on the other hand, is a unique TM, and I cannot teach it again if I forget it. Because Beedrill learned Twin Needle through level up, it could be reminded of this move. However, the move reminder is only available once I reach the Sevi Islands, and that area of the game is optional, so normally I don't even go there. So that point has to be done. Actually, it's not. I need to show you one more thing. Let's look at Beedrill's tutor moveset. It can it consists of only four moves, Swords Dance, Double Edge, Mimic, and Substitute. Of course, two of these are fantastic, and you'd expect Beedrill to rely on them in this playthrough. I'm speaking of Swords Dance and Substitute. Funny story, Game Freak made the Swords Dance tutor only available in the Sevi Islands after you defeat the champion. So no, Beedrill won't be able to use that powerful move today. Luckily, it will be able to use Substitute. And so hopefully now you can see how having four fantastic moves at this point in the game causes issues. There are a lot of Intimidate users in Fire Red, using Substitute stops this ability from triggering mid-battle. But in order to learn Substitute, I have to give up one of my current moves. And we haven't even gotten into scenarios where perhaps I'll need rest. Hilariously, this issue actually gets worse once I leave Rock Tunnel, because then I can pick up the TM for Return. Unlike in Pokemon Crystal and in Pokemon Emerald, this is a one-time TM. There is no other way to get a second copy of it. It's a really good thing that I didn't teach it to be drill right away, so that I can maintain some degree of moveset flexibility. In Celadon City, I first have to complete the Rocket Hideout. Giovanni's entire team is weak to fighting type moves, so Brick Break is a spammable option against them. I was feeling really good about this fight until the Kangaskhan comes out, and then it uses Fake Out, which actually does a decent amount of damage, and it follows this up with Mega Punch, taking Beedrill to orange. Brick Break does half, but that does mean Kangaskhan is going to get one more attack in. Luckily it just uses Tail Whip, so the AI threw that fight. I anticipated the need for moveset flexibility, so in the department store I buy myself a second Brick Break TM. While I'm here I pick up some protein, so Beedrill's attack is as high as possible. After all, it's one of the Pokemon you obtain in the early game, it is definitely not designed for the late game, and that's where I'm headed. To get there though, I have to beat more gym leaders, and I think Erica makes sense to face next. Inside the gym, I only fight the two mandatory trainers, and with that, I'm ready to take on the grass-type specialist.
Victory Bell is first, I use Aerial Ace doing more than half, and then the Grass type paralyzes Beedrill. Not the best way to start a battle. That said, my typing is fantastic against her. She uses a Hyper Potion, it really delays the knockout, but in the end Beedrill doesn't take much damage before it moves on to the Tangela. At only level 24, I was confident Beedrill would one hit, but it just barely doesn't. I guess that's due to the fact that it doesn't have great base stats. After all, I am 12 levels higher. Her last Pokemon is Vileplume, and this time I crit, so it goes down in a single hit. Even with the status condition, Beedrill had no problems. I felt like I was getting a little bit behind with my training, so I go to the Fighting Dojo next. My typing is fantastic here defensively, and I figured that Aerial Ace would get a bunch of one hits. That said, it does not. So many of these fighting types take two hits to knock out. That fact alone made me very happy that I decided to do this additional training. I had my fingers crossed that the rival in Pokemon Tower wouldn't be challenging. By this point, I am very overleveled, and Brick Break is neutral against the Pidgeotto, but it doesn't get the knockout. Even even if I got hit by a sand attack, it wouldn't be the end of the world though, because I still have Aerial Ace. In this case, with my accuracy unaffected, I knock out the Execute and the Kadabra in one hit each. He chooses Charmeleon next. My Brick Break once again fails to get the knockout, and this fire type uses Smoke Screen. Time for Aerial Ace. I finish his Ace off and move on to Gyarados. Note here, this is the first mid-battle Pokemon that has Intimidate. Honestly, I'm quite lucky that it came out last. First turn I hit with Secret Power, causing Paralysis, and from there, two more Aerial Aces are enough to knock it out. At the end of the fight, Beedrill has a chance to learn Agility, and this just makes me even more salty that I can't obtain Swords Dance. This move was once useful on Beedrill in Generation 1, but unfortunately, without a badge boost glitch, it's just not going to be helpful today. You know what I thought was going to be helpful? Teaching Beedrill return in the place of secret power. By making this choice, we have now gone from two moves that are flexible down to one. The only thing I can delete is Brick Break if I want something else. Throughout Pokemon Tower, I fight some optional trainers, and then I continue my training by battling the vast majority of trainers on Cycling Road. Because these games are a closer analog to Red and Blue, the next place that I'm headed is Koga's Gym. The trainers in here give good experience yields, so I'm going to beat all of them before taking on the gym leader. Koga leads with a coughing, and it isn't really that scary because its best move is probably Smokescreen. That said, I have Aerial Ace, so it doesn't even matter. The Muck that's next likes to use Minimize, which is irrelevant. On the second turn, it uses Acid Armor, and then Beedrill crits. Wow, this thing has answers for everything Koga throws at it. It continues its spree by critting the next coughing, and now it's time for Wheezing. There's a big change here between Red and Blue. This thing no longer has Self Destruct. As a result, it's much less intimidating, and I easily take it out, earning myself the fifth badge. I didn't think facing Blaine next made a lot of sense. I think Beedrill is going to struggle there a little bit, even though his team isn't as good as it is in Yellow version. For now, what I'm going to do is go to Sylph and battle a lot of optional trainers to level Beedrill up more. After all, it is going to have to defeat the Elite Four and the Champion, and I expect that it's going to need to be very overleveled for that. In previous episodes of this series, I have run into problems during the League where I'm not leveled up enough. I'm thinking specifically about Pidgeot and Raticate. I I don't want that to happen for Beedrill today. After defeating many of the trainers in this company slash dungeon area, I am level 53, and I figured that that might be overleveled enough to take on the rival. His Pidgeot is up first, as is always the case. I go for Return, because this is the best move I can use against it. It does much more than half, but not enough to KO, allowing the Flying type to use Feather Dance, sharply lowering my attack stat. From there, this fight is just not going to work out. While I am able to knock out both the Execute and the Alakazam, he then sends in his ace Charizard, which goes for Scary Face, followed by Flamethrower. The fire type move does more than half, and as a result, I am not able to knock it out, just because I'm doing less. I was about to say I tried again, but uh, I don't know if I tried. This next fight is a train wreck. I get paralyzed by the Execute after making terrible move choices against the Pidgeot, and with my speed cut, I'm not going to be able to knock out the Alakazam and the Charizard, so I decided to reset quickly. 
What are the possible win conditions here against the Charizard specifically? Well, I could get a critical hit, knock it out in one turn, move on to the Gyarados, and finish it with only two hits. Okay, um, yeah, that was really lucky. I, I will take that win, but it makes me very worried for what's coming up with Rival 6 and the Champion Battle. At the end of Sylph, Giovanni is simple, so now what should Beedrill do next? Well, because of its high speed stat, I figured taking on Sabrina was going to be very simple. I fight a bunch of the trainers in her gym for experience, and then I completely stomp the Psychic type specialist. I'm sure some of you are anticipating that this might be challenging, but it really isn't. High physical attack and speed are all you need to defeat her frail Pokémon. On my way south to Cinnabar Island, I fight a bunch of optional trainers for more experience. I am really trying to emphasize all of this optional training for all of you, because sometimes in these edited videos, these long stretches of the game where I'm just leveling up a bit get cut out, and you don't get a sense for just how much I was investing. Believe me, I am not hoping for incredible returns, after all, that move's power is already maxed out. After completing Pokemon Mansion and defeating some of the trainers in the Cinnabar Gym, I'm now ready to take on the Fire-type Specialist. Blaine's first Pokemon is Growlithe, which has Intimidate, lowering my attack stat right away. I use Return, and I still get the one hit. Okay, that's good. I'll probably knock the Ponyta out as well. Uh, no I don't. It survives with Red, uses Fire Blast, and does more than a third. Blaine can't save it with a Hyper Potion, but next is Rapidash, and of course if the Ponyta survived, this thing is going to as well, and it does massive damage with Fire Blast. Once again, Beedrill survives. That's its decent special defense for you. However, after a Citrus Berry, I only have yellow health left over for the Arcanine. And it also has Intimidate. With Beedrill's attack stat ruined, it can't do very much damage even when it's using its most powerful move, and that's a reset. I needed a way to counteract at least one of the Intimidates, and the obvious choice is to teach Beedrill Substitute. However, if I choose to teach it now, it will come with a consequence, because this move tutor can only be utilized once. Because of that, I am going to have to hold on to Substitute as long as I want it, further constraining my moveset. My choices are replacing Return, Twin Needle, Aerial Ace, or Brick Break. In the end, since Brick Break is the most flexible, I decided to replace it. But this doesn't solve my problem, because every time I set it up, Growlithe just breaks the substitute by using Fire Blast. If it's not possible to survive one hit here, then it really won't be against Blaine's later Pokémon. Unfortunately for Beedrill, the only answer at level 59 is to do more training. I fight everyone in Blaine's gym, as well as on the water routes surrounding the Seafoam Islands. This brings Beedrill up to level 63, and then I face Blaine again. Okay, so with one Intimidate, can I knock the Growlithe out in one hit? Well, yes I can if I get a crit. Next is Ponyta, it goes down to a single return, and then he sends in Rapidash. Now this one is going to survive. It uses Fire Blast, which does under half to Beedrill, and then, after two Hyper Potions, I knock it out. Okay, so the second Intimidate comes down from the Arcanine. I'm gonna need probably three hits to knock it out, and I just don't think I'm gonna survive its Fire Blast. However, in the moment of truth, Beedrill gets another critical hit, and Arc Arcanine goes down. So I did it, but uh, I don't really feel like I earned it. I think Beedrill probably needed to be a higher level to win that fight. This fact makes me very worried for the later stages of the game. However, I expected that Beedrill wouldn't perform particularly well, so I've been preparing for this by saving all of my rare candies. Giovanni's gym is next, and that means I have to face Cool Trainer Warren. Before that, I needed to prepare for his rock types, and to do this, I teach Giga Drain in the place of Return. Turn. Let me explain my reasoning here. In Generation 1, normal type moves really aren't that good past the 8th gym. I really wanted to keep Substitute because I think it's going to be very useful throughout the league. Aerial Ace is essentially the only move I have that deals decent damage to Agatha's Pokémon, and I was keeping Twin Needle just to deal with the champions Alakazam and Executor. So if I wanted to get through the rock ground types in this gym quickly, the only option I had was to delete Return. By doing this I am making a logical mistake. Aerial Ace is super effective against Executor, and Return is physical, so it would do decently well against Alakazam. Removing it here was definitely not the right choice. What I should have done was deleted Twin Needle, however here's my thought process around keeping it. 
I didn't want to give up my only same type attack bonus move, and I had just streamed Beedrill with Gym Leader Matt in yellow version, and in that game, the bug move was very useful. That said, we're not going to see the impacts of this choice until a little while from now. Warren isn't an issue, and with him out of the way, I fight some optional trainers to get almost to level 65 before I take on Giovanni. In Fire Red, his team is a bit of a joke. He leads with Rhyhorn. I'm not going to set up Substitute here because it knows Rock Blast and Earthquake. Instead, I just one-shot with Giga Drain, and then he sends in his ace, Rhyhorn. Yes, his ace is a Rhyhorn, I've said this a lot. It's really funny. Of course, Giga Drain continues its spree, knocking it out, as well as the following Doug Trio. Nido Queen is next. I thought that maybe I could establish a Substitute here, but no, Earthquake is just doing too much damage. So, I have to attack, and in this case, Giga Drain is doing about a third. I'm using this move, even though it's neutral, just so that I can gain back some health and move on to the Nido King with a decent amount of health left over. Of course, I'm out of Giga Drain PP now, so I have to use Aerial Ace. In this case, it does half. Nido King uses Earthquake, Beedrill survives, and with that, I finish Giovanni. That was a decently close fight, despite how bad his team is. After all, the Nidos are quite good against Beedrill. But you know what's even better than the Nidos against Beedrill? The rival's Pidgeot. I really wanted to be able to utilize Substitute here to block Feather Dance, but Pidgeot uses Wing Attack and breaks my Substitute. I thought maybe the AI would choose Feather Dance, so I tried again, it doesn't work, and as a result, Aerial Ace isn't able to do enough damage, and that's a reset. I toyed around with the idea of using Brick Break during this fight, but I didn't want to give up Giga Drain before I defeat Lorelei. I'm keeping the other moves for the same reasons that I was before. If I spam Aerial Ace to do as much damage as possible to the Pidgeot, then uh, this time it uses Feather Dance. Are you kidding me? That is really frustrating. But this loss isn't all bad because now I know it can go for the status move. Armed with this powerful knowledge, I use Substitute on the first turn of the next battle and Pidgeot uses Feather Dance which fails. Okay, perfect. Now I can use Aerial Ace. It fails another Feather Dance. I take the bird to red health. It fails a third Feather Dance in a row, and then Beedrill knocks it out. I don't know if I'm going to get this kind of luck in the future, so this has to be the fight. Twin Needle knocks the Alakazam out in, well, two hits, but just one turn. Next, he sends in Rhyhorn, which Giga Drain takes care of, and then it's time to face his Charizard. I think I need Aerial Ace to knock it out in two turns, but unfortunately, Unfortunately for Beedrill, its hit does what looks like a quarter, maybe a third if we're being generous. It's definitely going to take four non-crit hits to knock it out. But something strange happens here. Charizard just spams Scary Face three times in a row, allowing me to knock it out for free. I'm going to talk about why the AI did this in a little bit, but first let's finish the battle. Next, he sends in Gyarados, but my substitute blocks its Intimidate. My best choice here continues to be Aerial Ace. In this case, it's doing about a third, and Gyarados really doesn't do anything. My substitute tanks its Hydro Pump, and then it sets up Rain Dance before being knocked out. All that remains is Execute, and of course, Twin Needle easily one-shots. After that fight, I wasn't sure if I had gotten lucky or if there was some AI quirk at play that was causing the opponent to spam status moves. Luckily for all of us, there is a lot of documentation on how the Generation 3 AI works online. If you're curious about viewing the full document for yourself, please check out the link in the description of this video. I take no credit for compiling this document, it was done to aid players with Emerald Kaizo runs, and after I discovered it last year, it can also help me with Generation 3 play. Throughs. I did a quick search in the document for Scary Face, and yes, there is a section for speed lowering moves. This includes other moves as well, like Icy Wind, Mud Shot, Rock Tomb, and String Shot. Here's what it says about how the AI uses these moves. Just for some context, the AI is always going to choose the move that scores the highest. You'll notice that I mentioned some percentages here, and that's because sometimes scores are allocated based on statistics. So it's not always like it gets plus one if the opponent is slower. Okay, so according to this documentation, here is how speed altering moves work. They receive a minus three score if the user is faster than the target. However, if the user is slower than the target, then there is a 73% chance of getting a plus two score. As a result, the AI will attempt to use the move 86% of the time. So that answers the question I had before. I wasn't just getting lucky in the final fight. The way the AI works caused those interactions to give Beedrill the win. I want you to keep this in mind because during the Elite Four, there are going to be other Pokemon that have 
have scary face on their moveset. That said, I still need to do some preparation first. In Victory Road, I fight some optional trainers to level Beedrill up to 68. I think this should be enough training. I'll use 10 rare candies now to boost Beedrill up to 78. I save locking in that choice, and now I'm ready to face the Elite Four. I expect that Lorelei won't be that bad at this level. I was hoping Substitute would survive the Dugong, but it breaks it fairly quickly and I just decide to knock it out. Next is Slowbro. While this thing is usually tanky, Twin Needle is super effective and I also get a critical hit, so I take it down in one turn. That's a bit surprising. Next is Cloister. Now in Generation 3, this thing doesn't have particularly good moves, so I can take my time here setting up Substitute before the rest of the fight. Giga Drain does a lot of damage because Cloister's special defense is really not that good. It actually has lower special defense than special attack. Jinx follows, but Twin Needle is more than enough, so Beedrill has made it to Lorelei's final Pokemon on its first attempt. Aerial Ace does about a quarter, Lapras takes two turns to break my substitute. After my third hit, it recovers some health using a Citrus Berry, but then Body Slam paralyzes and Lorelei uses a full restore. Unfortunately for me, I can't heal enough health with Giga Drain, and Beedrill does have a loss. It's not the end of the world though, because I make it back to the Lapras in the next fight. Also in this case, I realized that I could be using Twin Needle for a chance to poison. I go for it, getting the status condition, and it finishes Lapras off. So, I've made it to the second Elite Four member. Giga Drain 1 hits the Onyx. From there, I set up Substitute, but Hitmonchan just breaks it with Rock Tomb. Okay, I'm just gonna go for Aerial Ace and knock it out. Next, he sends in Machamp, but here, Aerial Ace gets a critical hit, knocking the Ace Pokemon out. After that, I can easily clean up the remaining Hitmonlee and Onyx. Here's a funny fact about Agatha's Gengar. If you have Substitute, you can use it essentially for free because this thing loves to spam double team on turn one. Of course, Aerial Ace just doesn't care, so I'm able to finish it off in two hits essentially for free. Golbat is next. I do less than half to it and it breaks my Substitute, which is kind of annoying. I decided to go for the KO, but I don't get it and Air Cutter is doing a decent amount which is problematic because Agatha uses a full restore, and then the Golbat brings me down to red health before I knock it out. Haunter is next, it knows Hypnosis, putting Beedrill to sleep, and so on the next turn, because of the status condition, I lose due to Dream Eater. I hadn't realized it before, but this Psychic-type move is the Haunter's only damage-dealing move. Granted, it can deal indirect damage with Curse. This time, the Golbat doesn't break my Substitute, because it's trying to use Confuse Ray, which can't affect me. The Haunter's Hypnosis misses, and I knock it out over three turns after a full restore, and then Agatha sends in her ace, Gengar. It goes for Shadow Ball, which does not break my substitute, and Beedrill with its second turn gets a critical hit, finishing her final ghost. The Pokemon she has saved is Arbok, and of course it's not very good, so Beedrill has made it to Lance, and that's when the true realization sank in that Beedrill is just really not prepared for his flying-type Pokemon. First is Gyarados, and the best move I have here is either Giga Drain or Aerial Ace. I try to set up Substitute, and yes, Dragon Rage will not break this. So that's good. My Substitute gets broken, I reset it, Gyarados uses Dragon Rage, and I try Aerial Ace, which does more, but still not enough to get his lead to half health. I honestly was not sure how to deal with the Gyarados, but right before I knock it out, Lance switches to Aerodactyl, and that's when my hopes were crushed. This thing knows Ancient Power and Wing Attack, and as a Rock type, I have nothing that's good against against it. Like, I guess Giga Drain is passable, but it's really not what I want to be using. I thought maybe Brick Break would do better against the Aerodactyl because it leverages my higher attack stat, but do remember that this whole fight starts off and I am behind because Gyarados has Intimidate. Because of this, even at level 79, I don't think my Beedrill is going to be able to get by Lance. So I have all my HM users faint, and I backtrack to Victory Road. Here at the very end of the cave, there is the Move Tutor for Double Edge, and I decided to teach this to Beedrill in the place of Twin Needle. Starting in Generation 2, Double Edge's base power was upgraded from 100 to 120. It's not all good news though, because starting in Generation 3, the recoil was increased from 1 quarter to 1 third. At this point in the run, I was really regretting regretting my choice to delete Return. I think the better decision would have been to hold on to Secret Power longer and then teach Return as Beedrill's late game move. 
Plus, a major logical flaw that I had throughout the entire run was holding onto Twin Needle for so long. You're also probably wondering why I'm not using very many held items, and that's just because in Fire Red, not many of them are available. Back in December, I played a lot of Pokemon Platinum, so I went to the game corner to try to buy coins so I could pick up the Silk Scarf, but no, you can't actually buy that item here. In Fire Red, it is only available in the post game. I defeat a bunch of trainers in Victory Road for more experience, and then I scour the region for people. PP boosting items. I think it may be the case that I need to black out again during the league, and if this happens and I've used one of them, I want to ensure that I have more for my next league attempt. Also, there is one more rare candy on the map. It's over here, past the other Snorlax. I don't really like coming down here, but with a weak Pokemon, I think it makes sense. I continue my training a little bit until Beedrill reaches 83, and then I head back to Indigo Plateau. One thing that's encouraging is Beedrill doesn't have as many problems against Lorelei now, because I've taught it Brick Break. This move continues to perform well against Bruno, especially when put in combination with Aerial Ace. Agatha does cause one reset for me, but it's mostly just luck-based. Beedrill doesn't really struggle here. And that leads me back to Lance. I have two rare candies, so I'm going to use both of them to take Beedrill up from 84 to 86. Double Edge allows me to two-shot the Gyarados, and then Lance sends in Dragonite. I don't have my substitute anymore, so it goes for Wing Attack, which does massive damage, about half in this case, and so I made the decision to black out and continue my training by defeating Lorelei, Bruno, and Agatha over and over again. Each time I complete this run, I get another opportunity to test Beedrill against Lance, and at level 87, the answer is still no. By watching this video, you are not going to get an appreciation for just how frustrating this is, so guide your eyes up to the timer in the top left. We have passed the 2 hour and 30 minute mark in this run. For context, there are only two Pokemon that have times slower than this currently. Raticate finished the game with a time of 2 hours 35 minutes and 52 seconds, whereas Pidgeot finished the game with a time of 3 hours 14 minutes and 22 seconds. I should note though that Raticate finished at level 85 and Pidgeot finished at level 82. That means today Beedrill is going to set the record for the highest level finish, which is not a good record to have. After only two blackouts in the league, my Beedrill is level 88, so I can boost it with rare candies to 90. Even in this case, the Dragonite is just far too powerful. Plus, Double Edge is not doing half. If I had the two hit range, I think this might be possible with some good luck, but I don't currently. And that's when I decided to use a completely different strategy. I am going to finally, at long last, use a poison type move with my poison type Pokemon. And yeah, Beedrill's going to be using Toxic and Rest together to try to stall out Lance's Pokemon. I want you to know, as this plays out, I don't think this is a good strategy, but it just might be the best way for my Beedrill to get by Lance. This is more of a function of the mistakes that I made earlier in the playthrough, rather than a legitimate way to play the game. I also do want to mention that Beedrill is doing all of this with its hands tied hide behind its back. If Game Freak had made Sludge Bomb and Swords Dance available before this moment, I wouldn't be having any problems. Please think about the set Sludge Bomb, Substitute, Rest, and Swords Dance. I think Beedrill would destroy with that. And if you want to be a little bit more offensive, you can switch out Rest for Aerial Ace. I don't know, that one's kind of a stylistic choice. I think setting up and using Substitute all the time, I would prefer Rest, but it really doesn't matter. The first step in this battle is to stall the Gyarados out, and I want to have a Substitute in place when the Dragonite comes out. This will give me one turn to apply Toxic to it, and then I can use Substitute with my health to buy time. After that, I can continue buying time utilizing rest. Turns out there is a problem with this strategy, because the Dragonite can knock me out before I wake up from rest, and Toxic just barely doesn't have the damage needed to finish it off. Okay, but if I use a Chesto Berry, then I won't have to sleep for as long. However, sometimes I will need to rest against the Gyarados and burn this berry, and then the problem persists against Dragonite. I do want you to know that I thought this strategy could work, but I was also very frustrated and getting stubborn. Reset after reset after reset occur, and eventually I decided to black out and continue battling the league for experience. I contemplated the strategy of leveling up to level 100 as fast as is possible, and then teaching Beedrill double team so that I can use evasion boosting strategies against Lance. It was going to take a while to do the training, and the league is getting very repetitive, so my brain started to wander. I thought back across the playthrough wondering what I could have done better. And that's when it struck me. I should have kept 
secret power longer in the early game. I've mentioned that before, but thinking of this reminded me that secret power can be purchased at the department store, and this move will have a 30% chance to inflict paralysis. So at level 95, instead of continuing to battle Lance with Brick Break and Aerial Ace, I blacked out, went back to the department store, purchased the normal move, and came back to face Lance again. This is going to work, it's just going to take a little bit of luck. What I need to have happen is Paralysis afflict the Dragonite, well, I guess the Aerodactyl first if he chooses to send it in, and then hopefully afflict the Dragonite as well. Utilizing both Rest and Substitute gives me a lot more time in the battle for Paralysis's effects to stack up and actually make a difference. Using this strategy, I only have three more resets before finally at long last I knock out Lance's Dragonite. I have to say, I was really worried here that the Gyarados was just going to polish me off next, but I get a substitute in place, and it survives the Dragon Rage, and I'm able to use Rest plus my Chesto Berry to wake up. I re-establish Substitute and use Secret Power to knock the Water Serpent out. The only two Pokémon left are Dragonairs, and they are not difficult for Beedrill to deal with, so at long last, after great frustration, the early game bug has made it to the champion. Everyone please take a deep breath, because this fight starts off awfully once again because of the Pidgeot. Luckily it goes for Feather Dance turn 1, and I block it with Substitute. Then, Secret Power does more than half, and I block Sand Attack, knocking his lead out for free. Okay, that is a good start. The good news continues because I one-shot the Alakazam, but then Rhydon comes out, and I have to use either Aerial Ace or Secret Power against this thing, but this is where we need to remember the AI quirk I mentioned before. This Rock-type knows Scary Face. Beedrill currently has 256 speed, and Rhydon has 70, so it is really trying to lower my speed. It seems like, on average, Average, it uses more scary faces than rock tombs, but I still will get hit occasionally, despite the fact that this first fight makes it look like it uses scary face 90% of the time. Making things worse for Beedrill is the fact that the champion has full restores, and he uses two of them on Rhydon, which extends this battle significantly. But still, on my first attempt, I am able to make it past the Rhydon. Unfortunately though, the rival chooses Charizard next. Things are looking grim, but I might be able to win here with Paralysis. I do get the status condition, but Charizard still moves and Beedrill faints. Alright, let's examine another loss condition, and that is if Pidgeot uses Aerial Ace right away. Then I won't have a substitute, and the Rhydon will be more complicated. Plus I have to burn my Chesto Berry earlier on into the fight. I didn't realize that right now, but we're going to have a lot of losses here, so I'm just mentioning it to you, because later on as the resets really start to stack up, I'm going to start resetting against the Pidgeot as soon as it uses Aerial Ace. In my third fight against him, I tried a different different strategy. What about using Brick Break? Then I can use Aerial Ace against the Charizard. This greatly improves my abilities to knock the Rhydon out. I basically knock it out as if it was two turns. He does waste full restores here, which is really good because then he's not going to use them on the Charizard. However, even when I arrive with a substitute in place and green health, due to Brick Break, by the way, that would be much harder to achieve if I had faced the Rhydon using Secret Power. Even in this case, the Charizard is able to break my substitute, survive my second Aerial Ace, and knock Beedrill out from green health with Fire Blast. In the end, I decided that the correct strategy was to use Secret Power against the Rhydon and then the Charizard. The chance to two-hit and the ability to inflict Paralysis are what enabled this strategy to work. There are still, of course, risks. While I'm taking forever to knock the Rhydon out, it can get critical hits. When these occur, usually Beedrill is going to lose. I also tried one last strategy before again reverting to the Secret Power Aerial Ace Rest Substitute strategy, and that was to use Brick Break in the place of Rest. I thought maybe with Substitute I can just sweep his entire team to hitting the Charizard with Secret Power. Turns out this doesn't work because Secret Power does enough damage to activate a Citrus Berry, and then Beedrill doesn't have enough damage to take down the Fire Type. So here is essentially what I need to win. I have to make it by the Pidgeot without having my my attack lowered. I need to one-shot the Alakazam, which basically always happens. Then, I have to slowly knock the Rhydon out using Secret Power, hoping for Paralysis here, which will mess it up. My goal is also to make it through this part of the battle with decently high health. Then against the Charizard, I need to be able to survive two turns, because once it uses the Citrus Berry and goes to red health, he'll use a full restore, and then I can two-hit. So for the first time, just under 3 hours and 30 minutes, I have made it to the Executor. I was so scared it was going to use Sleep Powder 
here, so I went for Substitute to try to block the move, and it works out. After that, I use Rest, Healing, and then knock it out with a critical hit from Aerial Ace. So Beedrill has made it to the final Pokemon, Gyarados. I use Secret Power, it paralyzes, Gyarados uses Thrash, breaking my Substitute, but I establish another one, the status condition prevents a move, the champion uses a full restore, drawing things out a little bit longer, but it's not enough for him, and finally, at long last, Beedrill clocks in with its time. 3 hours, 30 minutes, and 19 seconds, with 55 resets at level 96. This is a game time of 10 hours and 24 minutes. Of all my Fire Red runs, this one is the worst. It is below Pidgeot, so today Beedrill is going to earn itself a spot in the Bruno tier. Of course, I still really like Beedrill, its design is awesome, but it's really not that capable of soloing the game. It's clear the developers wanted this Pokemon to teach players about evolution, and then become boxed later on into the game when they find better options. And speaking of better options, in the early game you also have access to Pokemon like Spearow, which evolves into Fero at a low-ish level. I think that that early game bird just might have a chance of doing quite well in this game. So next time in Fire Red, I will be doing a Fero run. Now before I close this video, I do want to mention the fact that up until now I have not been doing the League rematches. The reason for this is that you have to obtain the National decks in order to complete the Sevi Islands plot to repopulate the league. Obtaining the national decks requires a total of 60 Pokemon to be registered in your Pokedex, and that barrier doesn't really mesh well with the solo running format. Even catching just one or two HM users often bothers me because there is so much RNG involved, and it can really skew results. I didn't want to have to include an extended catching section of the game in every video and then rank Pokemon based on it, because that doesn't seem fair. Also, just modding out the requirement to have more Pokemon seems fundamentally wrong to me, so I decided not to include it as a portion of these videos. I'm sorry if this has been disappointing to you, I know a lot of people really want me to do the rematches. And of course, the best apology is just fixing the behavior that you're apologizing for in the first place. So today, for the first time, I am going to attempt the League rematches with Beedrill. Now, uh, there is a note that I have to make here, I never actually have beaten the League rematches ever, like in my entire life. When I was a kid, I would get to them and then they would be way too hard and I would lose interest in the game. So I am going into these battles completely blind. For this section of the game, I am not going to be timing it, it's more of a bonus portion of the video after the main run has been complete. If I add this section into every single one of my playthroughs, it's going to cause a lot of time bloat to take place, and I still haven't figured out exactly how I want to handle the question of obtaining the national decks. If you have suggestions about how you think that would be best handled, please let me know in the comments, and then in the future we can make another update to this format. For now, let's complete the Sevi Islands. Before I arrive at the League though, I have to upgrade Beedrill's moveset. Just before I complete the plotline on the Sevi Islands, I can pick up the TM for a Sludge Bomb, which I teach in the place of Secret Power. After completing the plotline, I head to Island 7, use the Move Tutor to teach Swords Dance in the place of Rest. I wasn't sure if this was the right choice, but I think my level 98 Beedrill, which will be a level 100 by the end of the game, is going to be enough to get through these final 5 battles without having to heal itself. Let's see if I was right, so now it is time for the League rematches. The first thing I realized when facing Lorelai is the fact that her team is slightly different than it was the first time around. In this case she has a Piloswine, which is not really a big upgrade. With access to Swords Dance and same type attack bonus damage, Beedrill has no problems here. Next is Bruno, and he is where things start to get a little bit more difficult. His two Onyx have evolved to Steelix. Using Brick Break I'm just barely not able to one hit them, even with one Swords Dance. That said, Beedrill is still able to win. However, when I arrived in Agatha's chamber, I realized that I had forgotten Aerial Ace, and without it, I'm not going to be able to deal much damage to her Ghost-type Pokémon. So I reset before Bruno, taught Brick Break in the place of Substitute, and went forward with this strategy. If you do a lot of Fire Red runs, I'm sure you will have noticed that this is a mistake. I really should have kept Substitute, but I will talk about why in a little bit. First, I have to take on Agatha, and honestly, she's not that difficult provided that Hypnosis doesn't mess me up. Once I defeat her, I have to go up against Lance again, and yes, he is problematic. Not for the reason he was before, though. In this case, the Gyarados now knows Thunder Wave. Without Substitute, I am not able to effectively block it, and then I can't set up 
because if I'm paralyzed I will be slower than the rest of his team, and by the time I reach the Kingdra there's no way for me to have enough health to win. Having already used the TM for rest I can't recover, and a Cherry Berry isn't an option because I don't currently have one. Unlike last time, Beedrill still has an option, because it can learn a Tract. This way, the Gyarados will have a 50% chance to hit me with Thunder Wave, and eventually I make it by without the status condition, and I'm able to sweep with Sludge Bomb boosted by Swords Dance. Okay, so the champion, the final battle in Fire Red, and interestingly enough, he has a Tyranitar. I love the fact that this Pokemon is on an opponent's team. In all of the standard battles in main series games up until this point, there has never been a trainer controlled Tyranitar, despite the fact that Karen is an Elite Four member. That always makes me a little bit sad. Also in this fight, he leads with a Heracross, which is really good for Beedrill because now the Pidgeot doesn't exist and there is no threat of Feather Dance. I pushed things a little bit far here, trying to set up with Swords Dance multiple times, and as a result, Rock Tomb lowers my speed. Because of the damage I've sustained and the fact that I am slower than most of his threatening Pokemon, this is a reset. I thought I could just come back and get hit by one Rock Tomb and then outspeed everything, however, Beedrill is slightly slower than the champion's Alakazam. Luckily for me, because my health is high, it chooses to set up with Calm Mind and I'm able to knock it out. From there, things are straightforward. I sweep through his final four Pokemon, and with that, Beedrill is victorious in the League rematches. These were so much easier than the first attempt, and I'm really glad I did them because it gave Beedrill an opportunity to shine with its best two moves. As far as my Fire Red series goes, this video has been a long one. Also, I'm not quite ready to start doing second playthroughs yet. My focus on this game for the next year is mostly just going to be enjoying myself doing first playthroughs with Evolution. As it stands right now, I would like to complete runs with every evolutionary line before I start doing my regular solo challenge content. That is, start starting either fully evolved or staying unevolved throughout the entire playthrough. After how enjoyable these League rematches were, I think that when I eventually switch over to my other format, I will include them as a portion of the run. Whenever I can make these challenges, well, more challenging, I am always going to do it. But for now, I still need to feel out the League rematches a little bit in this series, so I'm not going to add them as a timed component, and we are still going to rank Pokemon based on their first champion victory. Alright, so that's it for Fire Red this week. Next week, we are heading back to Platinum to start up that series for the year. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. You may have noticed I have made a slight change to the credits. I informed everyone with a post before I did this, just so I could get feedback. The way things work now is every time I release a video, there will be a section of the credits present in that video, and then over the course of three or four releases, we will make our way through the entire credit sequence. I've chosen to do things this way because sometimes my supporters go over the 700 mark at this point, and that makes this credit sequence take roughly 7 to 8 minutes. I don't want to pad my videos out that long at the end for each release, because the YouTube algorithm really doesn't favor videos when people click off early. Also, you can help me with the YouTube algorithm by liking the video and subscribing to my channel. At very least, it will inflate my ego, which always feels good. Alright, so that's it for this one. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.